It can be different. In the last 10 years, while we were losing real organic in the US, the EU tightened their standards. They were a little waffly on hydro, and they cut it out. It's illegal there now. Same time that we were saying, come on in, we, the USDA. They do not allow industrial scale CAFOs. What's the outcome of that? In the last year, EU organic sales surpassed those of the US. They're growing faster. Organic is growing faster in the EU than it is in the US. And this just, they're a billion dollars ahead of us in organic sales last I saw. This is a clear demonstration that we don't have to make weak standards that we don't enforce in order for organic to grow, because that's the excuse. Well, if, if we can't keep it really cheap, and the only way we can keep it cheap is by cheating, and we've got to have these industrial livestock in order to do that and have the cheap milk, and guess what? They're not making it so cheap there. They're following the standards, and it's growing. And the things that we want to have grow are growing, not just the name organic, but the reality of organic. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soil and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Dave Chapman, longtime organic tomato farmer and co-founder of The Real Organic Project in 2018. Dave is speaking on stage at the Saving Real Organic Conference this past October at Churchtown Dairy in Hudson, New York. He's going to be followed in this episode by his longtime friend and mentor, author and organic farmer, Elliot Coleman of Four Season Farm in Harborside, Maine. Dave and I actually swapped roles. He normally tells the depressing story at the beginning. And so now we're counting on him to tell us the story of hope right now, Dave Chapman. Before they start running the clock, thank you so much. I just want to thank everybody, you brave few who are still here after this long, cold day. And I want to thank Abby for everything she's done to make this possible. <laughs> and, and, and all of Abby's team, who have worked so hard. I mean, there's a lot that went into this. And for all of the people who supported this to make it happen, and for all the speakers, some of whom traveled a long distance. So thank you to everybody. I can't get out of it now. Uh, we have to start the clock. Um, Lindley's right. I am normally the person who does the first part. And frankly, it's much easier to create outrage about what's going on. And now I have been tasked with creating hope about what we can do. And that's not so easy for me, honestly. Um, I told Rehi that I was not an optimistic person. He said, never say that out loud. So um, what, what, what can we do? This is um, something that came up I spoke at a rally in 2017, and it was before, before there was a real organic project. We were still keep the soil and organic. And I was describing all the terrible things that were going on. And somebody called out, what can we do? And honestly, I froze, and my heart sank. And I thought, God, I don't know what we can do. And, and I said, you can write a letter to the USDA. And I, I was writing a lot of letters to the USDA, but I knew that that was a fairly hopeless task. So I have spent the last six years trying to come up with a better answer. And um, this is what I've done. 
I've learned a lot of things from all the speakers, uh, and not just today. Uh, in Zephyr's book, she had a really interesting description of the difference of the activism of Henry David Thoreau and Martin Luther King, and and that they both practiced civil disobedience, but they they had a somewhat different intention. And for Thoreau, it was really about living a life, a public life that was in in alignment with your inner life and and making sure there was integrity there. And for King, it was all of that, but it was also about taking actions that would further a cause of transformation. So he was seeking a public transformation, not just a personal transformation. And um, I think that that's an important difference. The, The Real Organic Project, you know, all the farmers could have taken the Thoreauvian path and said, you know, I'm going to live the life I believe in and I hope that it benefits the world. But we actually are an attempt to organize ourselves and and see if we can change a, a greater reality. I, I want to make clear that when I say ourselves, I'm speaking of everybody in this room. Right, we, we are all the real organic project. Even if you hadn't heard of this two weeks ago, you were already part of it, but now you're really trapped. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's no going back. And, and this is not something that Lindley or I or a small number of farmers do. It's something that a lot of us do. So I, I have to actually come up with it actions that you can take. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm going to start by talking about a little bit of the thing from Thoreau's perspective. This is so lovely to have birds singing. Uh, so from Thoreau's perspective, what can you do just in your personal way for your life? And, and the most obvious one is to eat well, which is wonderful. It's generous and selfish all at the same time. And if you can, grow a garden. It can be enormously transformative, even on a large scale. In World War II, the Victory Gardens supplied a third of the vegetables that were eaten in America. So if a lot of us do this, it's a big deal. If we only do it for ourselves, it's still a big deal for, our, for us. Um, make sure you eat real organic food. So going back to Kristen, we need to be activist eaters in order to have activist farmers. None of this works without eaters. And God forbid I should ever call us consumers ever again. (laughs) And and I won't, because Abby's absolutely right. It is important, the words we use, how it changes how we think. So we are people who eat, we are citizens. And as we take responsibility for that and make choices about what kind of food are we going to buy? Bart said earlier at a workshop that, that, you know, if we just ate real food, even if it wasn't organic, it would be a huge achievement for addressing a lot of the ills of this country. So that's right. And if we ate real organic food, then we're, we're going much, much further because it addresses more than, even than questions of personal health. You can... Ask, cajole, insist that the places that you do buy food from carry real organic food. And that's a big deal. I I have practiced this. And you go to a store and you say, you know, is this food really organic? And it it does change. You'll you'll have some very interesting conversations. Um, And that's your personal song. I think of that as a song that we all sing. But there's been a lot of talk today about choirs, you know, preaching to the choir, joining the choir, the choir is on fire, you know, and it's, it's right. And it's what happens. There's this magic when we start to connect and, and we, we start to uh, become a choir instead of just a single person. Because I talk a lot um, this way or that way, people have said, aren't you just preaching to the choir? And I say, it is a big choir. So I'm happy to preach to the choir. 
The choir has millions and millions of people in it. If we could ever get that choir to sing in some kind of harmony, we would take over the world. You know, that's the truth. If, if you go in, <laughs> thank you. If, if you go into five stores a month, try this, just one person, if, if, if you went and did that and you asked them, are, are these tomatoes, are these blueberries hydroponic that are certified as organic? Or if you asked, are these eggs, these certified organic eggs coming from a CAFO, from a confinement factory like we saw pictures of, they won't know the answer. They probably won't know what you're talking about. And they will probably think that you're a strange person, maybe even a wacko, right? It's like, okay, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find out, right? That's what... That's singing a song, but, but what if we all did it? What if everybody here went to five stores, and I will give the introverts an out. What if you wrote a letter, <laughs> right, to five stores a, in a month? And if we just did it for one month, I'm just curious, like, how many people go, well, maybe I would do that. I just want to see my loan, you know. Thank you for making me not be totally alone. So if we actually did that, and I don't know how many we have now, but we started with 200. So that would be a thousand, a thousand times in that month that stores would get these strange questions. And if we did that for a year, that would be 12,000 times that they got asked that question. Do you think that they would ignore that? Because I don't think so. Now, I understand that this probably won't happen, but it could. We all could do that. And what if we all got five friends to join us and do this? This is not like, well, that could never happen. That could happen. We could all get five friends who said, okay, I'm going to do this. We could have a little letter writing club. And once a month we get together, have a potluck and, a potluck and send out our questions and what does that put us up to? Uh, 60,000 letters that year? 60,000 letters to the stores? I think that we would see something happening. And that's just from this nucleus. Can you imagine if we started to do that in the whole country? We, we are preaching to a big choir. I just wanted to say that 94 million Americans chose to eat some kind of organic food in 2020. It's the last year I could get. A third of Americans try to buy organic food when they can, and more than half of Americans think that organic food is better for their health. And they're right. That's a lot of people. There are millions more in Canada, millions more in Mexico. The EU is huge. And what about China? We've been approached, Real Organic Project has been approached to see if we would set up a Real Organic Project in China. And we said, we don't have the resources for that, but you should do it. That's how this works. This is grassroots and we'll help you. But there are millions of people in China who are desperate to find real organic food. They have certified organic food there and they don't trust the government. And they're right not to trust the government. So there are millions of us around the world and what if we all got together? You know, what if we were able to get past our sense of defeat or hopelessness or apathy, whatever the things are that lead us to not act, to accept things that we really don't want? What if those millions wrote to the USDA and demanded immediate reform? We win. There will be immediate reform. It only took, what, I think 300,000 to get the nasty three thrown out when they set up the National Organic Program. And they wanted to include sewage sludge and irradiation and what was the third one? GMO, GMO right? And, and 300,000 people wrote and said, don't do that. And they immediately were like, okay, we can't do that, right? Well, imagine if a million people wrote and said, we don't want hydroponics to be certified as organic. We don't want confinement livestock to be certified as organic. We would win overnight. What if millions of people wrote to Congress and said, you know what? We aren't gonna just vote with our wallets. 
we're going to vote with our votes. Right? All of a sudden, people are getting nervous. Right? We're going to see changes. I understand this is not easy to actually do, but we can see that there is a path there. So if you're going to do this, you're going to have to educate yourselves as and I don't say this pointing a finger, I have to educate myself. I'm a very fortunate person. I get to talk to like so many wonderful, educated, informed people from this part and that part. And if you wanna follow that, it's all recorded and it's all on our website. And there are 140 interviews there and, and they're well worth listening to. So um, I, really, I really think that we can, somebody came to interview me who was writing a book on the agricultural movements that had grown out of um, the counterculture. And I was amazed at how knowledgeable this person was. I mean, he really knew a lot about what we were talking about. And it turned out he'd listened to all the podcasts. And I thought, wow, that really worked. <laughs> Our movement needs to be connected we need to be connected to each other. We have to find ways to do that. It's been very hard in the age of COVID, but we're coming back again now and we're able to meet together. We need to be connected with the land around us. We need to be connected to people who are actually quite far away and land that is actually quite far away. And we need to build a movement, as Ariel said, of genuine diversity, of young and old and white and black and rich and poor. We're all in this together. We all want the same thing. I have to speak about silence. Some people say we will hurt organic if we speak up. This has been a real plague upon our house. And I understand it. People were like, if we talk out loud about these things, we will damage organic. If we talk about the corruption in the USDA, we will damage organic. When I interviewed Michael Pollan, he said, and you will damage organic. You're right. He said, but if you don't speak up, it will destroy organic. So we have a tough choice, but we have to do it. The code of silence is not our friend. And I hate the phrase circular firing squad. It's, it's, it's one of the great phrases of people who don't want you to speak up. Oh, that's just a circular firing squad. No, it isn't. It's like, First of all, I'm not shooting at anybody, although I feel like I got a few, a few shots in my back. But, but it's, it's also true that the people I'm disagreeing with basically don't agree with me. They have a completely different concept of what good food should be, of what organic should be, and they're in a tiny minority, but they have tremendous power. And that's why we need to speak up together. We get it backwards when we think we can protect organic with our silence. Let's protect it with our loud and joyous voices. <clears throat> I am not an optimistic person. But as Vincent Stanley said, and Vincent is Yvonne Chouinard's nephew, and he was the marketing manager of Patagonia, and he's one of those 140 people that we got to interview. And he's such a kind person, and, and, but very insightful. He said, a sense of agency is more important than optimism. I'm going to say that again. A sense of agency is more important than optimism. And the example he used was Uncle Ivan, who is a complete pessimist, doesn't really like people, and would prefer to be alone. And yet he did a great deal to change the world in ways that he hoped would be helpful. So I think we need to find our sense of agency. We don't, we don't have to be optimistic about it. We just have to be committed to try and create some change and to know that we do have the power to do something here. There are six true things that I think can guide us in our sense of agency. One is that we are limited by our fear. Two, if you aren't confused, you aren't paying attention, All right? You should be confused. It's pretty confusing, and, and there are people who are very good at confusing us who are doing it full time. 
Three, no one is coming to save us. We have to do that ourselves. Four, we do not need anyone's permission to act. Five, the hour is late. Time is short. We need to act now. And six, we did it before and we can do it again. So other people said all these things today, except for the last one, probably Elliot's going to say it. <laughs> but they're all true. And we need to think bigger. And this is a little hard for me. You know, it seems hard enough, the little stuff that we're trying to work on. When we started, we were about creating reform of a few rules in the USDA and the way they're interpreting them. And <clears throat> as I got into it, it became bigger and bigger. The issues became bigger and they started to be connected. And I was like, well, this isn't just about hydroponics. There's all this confinement livestock I didn't even know about. And what's this grain fraud thing? I didn't know about it. And then what's going on? Why are, why are these, why is this so hard? Why are these things that we all agree on and the whole world agrees? There's a whole world movement. We're the only country in the world that has this kind of fraud and this battle going on. And we can look to them for inspiration and hope, but they're looking to us to do a better job because we have so much influence in the world. We, the United States of America, and it's going to be up to us to try and fix that. Some people say that organic can only succeed if we build a big tent. I don't know if you've heard that phrase, but it's very popular in the organic industry. Build a big tent, we need to build a big tent. We, we need to invite everybody in to create the change. And who they basically invite in is Godzilla and Gorgo, <laughs> right? And they sit down at the table and guess what? We're gonna eat whatever they would like to eat. You know, they, they have so much power. And so I'm not against big companies doing the right thing, but I am against us losing our vision because of them. And I'm happy to have them come in, but I prefer they check their gun at the door, which means they can come in as people, but don't come in as Monsanto, right? I'm gonna go over time, I'm sorry. Since 2010, the USDA has redefined organic, and we've heard about it a lot today. And this kind of fantasy organic is taking over the market, and it's pushing out the real organic farmers. And it's making it impossible to use this critically important identity to find what we want to find. This has allowed Herbrooks, it's an egg company, um, in a single facility to produce 10% of the U.S. certified organic eggs in a single facility. That was according to the Washington Post. It has allowed Driscoll's, the biggest berry company in the world, to provide 70% of the certified organic berries in America. And that is Driscoll's own claim, not mine. And that was in 2016 and they said we're growing fast. So it's probably more than 70% now. As Zephyr has said, when these companies dominate the market, and I can tell you I got the tire tracks across my back to prove it, they dominate the decisions about the market. They dominate the certifiers, the distributors, the stores, and the government. And that is why it is illegal. I say it again, monopolies are not illegal because they threaten consumers with higher prices. We, the citizens of America, made it illegal because they threaten democracy. They threaten us as citizens. And that's why we should enforce those laws and break these up. We need to be citizens instead of consumers, lions instead of sheep. It can be different. In the last 10 years, while we were losing real organic in the US, the EU tightened their standards. They were a little waffly on hydro and they cut it out. It's illegal there now. Same time that we were saying, come on in, we, the USDA. 
They do not allow industrial scale CAFOs. What's the outcome of that? In the last year, EU organic sales surpassed those of the US. They're growing faster. Organic is growing faster in the EU than it is in the US. And this just, they're a billion dollars ahead of us in organic sales last I saw. This is a clear demonstration that we don't have to make weak standards that we don't enforce in order for organic to grow, because that's the excuse. Well, if, if we can't keep it really cheap, and the only way we can keep it cheap is by cheating, and we've got to have these industrial livestock in order to do that and have the cheap milk, and guess what? They're not making it so cheap there. They're following the standards, and it's growing. And the things that we want to have grow are growing, not just the name organic, but the reality of organic. The European Union passed an initiative that they called Farm to Fork. It's a pretty visionary attempt to transform the world. And just to put it simply, they have committed to reducing the use of chemicals in agriculture by 50%. I'm talking about in conventional agriculture, their goal is to cut the use of chemical inputs by 50% by 2030. And at the same time, they want to increase the percentage of certified organic farmland to 25% of their farmland. Now, this is a radical proposition. And this is what the government has come up with. And the countries are actually working to achieve it, which is pretty amazing. By the way, the USDA fights this tooth and nail around the world. They hate this, of course. And it shows who they're truly aligned with. Let's talk about Denmark. Paul Hawkins said, you can't talk about Denmark. It's, you know, it's different. Well, why not? Why can't we do it in Vermont if we can do it in Denmark? Right? It's a small, enlightened state. So the Danish government has committed $150 million to support organic farming. It's a little country. That is $22 from every citizen. Everybody in the country pays $22 to support organic. That would be, if we did it in America, that would be $7 billion committed to supporting organic. They did it, why can't we, right? Over there, organic certification is free to all farms. 5% of Danish citizens visit an organic farm every year. The government does all this because they believe that all citizens benefit from organic agriculture, not just the ones who choose to buy organic in the stores. And they have lots of ways in which they're trying to promote this and develop it. I, Already ran out of time, so I won't go into it. Holland, the Dutch government, has committed $53 million for organic market development. That's only about $8.50 for every citizen. Again, if we made the similar commitment, that would be $2.9 billion from in the US. So if we wanted to be more moderate, we could just, you know, set aside $3 billion to promote organic agriculture. Instead, you heard about from Ben how we're spending it on climate dumb agriculture. Same amount, $3 billion. But it is possible to create change. We just have to find a way. We have to think bigger. We have to enforce the antitrust laws that we already have. I think that until we limit the power of the corporations, we're not gonna be able to change the government. And I don't think until we can do that, we will be able to change the marketplace at scale. And we can't enforce the antitrust laws without a movement. You know, there was an interesting discussion in the policy thing about, well, should we focus on changing government or should we focus on building the alternative system? Real organic is primarily focused on the alternative system, but we ultimately can't do either unless we build a movement. And if we build a movement, we can do both. So my own answer to the question, what can we do, has been to work with other farmers to create the Real Organic Project, which did not exist five years ago. This was so simple, so obvious, as to now seem naive. 
an organic standard based on the law. It's a good law. Enforced? What madness, right? But we are doing it. Right now, our tiny organization with 10 people on staff, no overhead, no offices, and we don't charge farmers anything for certification. And we have 1,100 farms we've certified. We've created a, a, a joint venture with Notcher Land that was talked about. They're very, very trusted internationally, highly respected. They're an add-on label like us. They, have, they certify 140,000 farms around the world. Pretty amazing. We put out a weekly letter read by thousands. We hold conferences like this one. We have 140 podcast interviews. Those are listened to by thousands of people every week. We have a new website coming out tomorrow. I hope you enjoy it. I hope everybody goes to it. So we're just constantly talking to farmers, to eaters, and we're listening and we're sharing. I think of us as the watering hole where everybody goes. We're the dating service where people who are good farmers can get connected to eaters who care. The last thing I'll say is that we need to come together. We need your help in any way that you can. So um, for some of you, you don't have any money. You can't help with that. So find somebody who does have some money would be a great help. <laughs> right? That's okay. You know, and for some of you, you, you can donate and support this. this. We work on a shoestring budget. But when I say we, I truly mean we, right? Some of us are doing this for a living and, and like Ariel's traveling around the country going to all these farms and talking and listening and talking and listening, right? And, and she's one of whatever five of us who are doing that. So we do, need, we do need some money, but we need your creativity. We need your, your resourcefulness and your good thinking. There's a lot of it here. We need your network of friends. We need you to forward every letter to 50 people. All of a sudden, we have a lot more people reading the letters. So that's enough. I'm so far over my time. So thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not going away yet. I, I, I want to introduce our final speaker of the day is Elliot Coleman. And um, Elliot is an old friend of mine. But beyond that, he has done more than anybody that I can think of to build an organic movement in America. And uh, he's always made it look fun. Um, I, I met him as a qu quite young farmer and he immediately befriended me and taught me a great deal and shared his amazing library. But he's done so much more than that and reached out in so many ways. So I'm really happy to have him come up and close this conference today. Elliot. Leave that there. Okay. And I want to lift it up. Yeah. Okay, I was given some good advice years ago by my father. He said, uh, he told me, what you do if you're the last speaker on the agenda at a long conference. <laughs> and he said, start off with a joke. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a joke. And we've talked about dairy farms and things like that. So this is a, a joke at a dairy farm. Uh, the dairy farmer had a cow. Uh, had it just uh, given birth, 
and it went down on him. And he called the vet. And at the time he called the vet, uh, the county agent happened to be there in the office of the vet visiting him. And the vet said, listen, you USDA guys, you think organic farmers are crazy. You ever been to visit one? The guy said, no, 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 never, never. He said, listen, come with me. I'm going to this organic farm. He's got a vet problem. The USDA guy says, oh, OK, I'll come with you. So they go there. They get there together. And it's a simple problem. The vet notices that it's a milk fever. Uh, a pretty simple thing to solve. He says, yeah, I got some dope in my bag for that. And he uh, uh, gives the cow a, a shot. And it's amazing how effective that can be with milk fever. The cow is back on its feet, and the organic dairy farmer is happy. And he says to that, well, yeah, that's just great. What do I owe you? And he said, oh, that'll be $10 for my time and $5 for the dope. And so the organic farmer takes out his wallet and gives the vet $10 and gives the county agent 5 <laughs> So Dave usually tries to keep me in the background because I'm a I'm not as pacifistic about this battle as he is and I really uh, object after a while to the to the doormats that we have been uh, as far as the USDA and their decisions have been and I want to bring up some heroes one of them is a gentleman named Arthur Harvey, who if you haven't heard of Arthur Harvey, he's a true hero because back in 2002, when the regulations came out, he sued the USDA because they were allowing uh, uh, chemical additives in, in prepared foods. And he lost the case in court. He, was his own lawyer, he paid all his own bills, went and, and uh, took it to the next court, and he won. And this was just unbelievable. And if you read some of the uh, uh, news items at the time, that Harvey's lawsuit uh, would have hurt both large and small organic growers and slowed the growth of the entire industry. And so, uh, you know, what are you going to do about some guy like Arthur Harvey who uh, uh, can have that sort of power? Well, the Organic Trade Association uh, did a backdoor deal uh, with the government, and they got them to put a rider on a, a bill that was going through that totally invalidated Harvey's point. Just took it out of there. And a lot of their members were unhappy, but uh, basically the uh, Organic Trade Association never bothered to ask the people whether they wanted that done. They didn't ask their members, and uh, it was not a, a happy scene. Uh, so, person, Number two, there was a, uh, an egg producer in Massachusetts called the Country Hen. And they applied to a certifier, Bay State, and they wanted to get certified so their eggs could be organic. And Bay State took one look around this place and said, but you guys don't have any outdoor access. We can't certify you. And uh, uh, the country sent hen said, oh, yeah, but we're going to build some porches uh, next week. And, and this was what was really unbelievable. They had been turned down. Uh, Bay State refused to certify them. And then overnight, I think this took one day, the USDA came through and said, no, you can't do that 
they are certified. And all, ever since then, this country hen has been selling their eggs as organic. Now, this is where we have become a doormat. And that's the thing that has truly gotten to me after a while, that they, they don't even have to have a vote or anything. They just uh, uh, pull things. So when, if I go back to 2002, about the same time uh, Arthur Harvey uh, uh, put his suit in, I wrote an article about the new world. Everything is going to be different because uh, the USDA has uh, going to be in charge of organic. And of course, I didn't think that was true. I thought that was totally bogus. And I thought exactly what has happened was going to happen. And you know, I said when I, in the article, when I started as an organic grower 50 years ago, organic was a way of thinking rather than a profit center. It became a profit center. It was taken over by all those people. And you know, my delight in the intricacies of the natural world, my adventure into an ever deeper appreciation of the soil, plant, animal, nutrition cycle, and how to optimize it, is not acceptable to the homogenized mentality of mass marketing. And when that was published, and it was published in uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mother Earth News, uh, the last paragraph in that article said, in my opinion, organic is now dead. This is 2002, I was brave enough to publish that as the meaningful synonym for the highest quality food. We need to come up with a, a, another term. And back then I suggested real food. Well, uh, because I am totally not intimidated by the USDA, uh, the sign at the end of our driveway says, Guaranteed real organic. And I've been told that I can't do that. The USDA owns the word organic. I said, no, they don't. Uh, it, I'm not using the word organic. I'm using the word real organic. And I explained to people that that's a neologism. And that gets a blank look. And they said, what the hell is a neologism? Well. Neo means new, logos means word, it's a new word. And they may control organic, but they don't control real organic. Uh, I am presently waiting, and I've been waiting since I put that sign up, uh, for the black helicopters to arrive and, <laughs> and take me off. But in order to emphasize it, we have a, this little piece of paper pinned up at our farm stand. We farm the way organic used to mean. First Season Farm has been farmed organically since its inception in 1968. However, we are, in, in bold, not USDA certified. I repeat, not, and for good reason. Uh, the USDA isn't upholding all the standards. Hydroponic vegetables are sold everywhere. Undesirable additives are allowed in your prepared food. That's the Arthur Harvey thing. Confined animal feeding operations. Are, uh, and, and so since they haven't come to get me yet, uh, yeah, think about this. The USDA goes after a, a, one of the older organic farmers in the country to sue him for using the word organic? My God, would that get publicity? Suicide. Yeah, no, it would be political suicide. You're right, that's why they won't do it. Um, but I have to do something. I'm a, a, so I put some sticky paper into my, computer and typed out these little signs. And it says, this is hydroponic, not organic. And you know, I cut them out like that. And I go into the local stores where 
there's all the Driscoll's the clamshells with, and I just go. <laughs> as I walk down the row, and I want everybody <laughs> to do that. What a what a wonderful way to to uh, uh, subvert that now dominant paradigm, and and not let them get away with it, because. If we don't do something, we are still doormats. And that, I just, that, I, I can't live with that. I can't live with allowing these people to take, at, and this happened at the meeting in Vermont, one of our first uh, protests against this. Uh, we had all sorts of people stand up and, and say th things. And Jake Guest, who's here somewhere, stood up and said, damn it, that's our word. And I agree, that's our word. <laughs> and and uh, we can use it, and they can't take it away from us. And, you know, you've heard of this all before today. I'm just re-emphasizing it with a joke. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. Our movement is growing because you are subscribing and sharing these podcasts with your friends. Keep it up and leave us a rating and a review as well. You can find a video version of this interview on our newly designed website, realorganicproject.org, or on our YouTube channel. Join us next time when we'll hear from farmer Ben Dobson. He's the co-founder of both Hudson Carbon and Hudson Hemp, and his experiments have tested cropland for carbon sequestration and this has led to his skepticism of the term climate smart farming. See you next time.